welcome to another episode of the Underground Bunker Podcast. This is your proprietor, Tony Ortega, and I'm joined by Clarissa Adams. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's so exciting for me. I, You know, uh, we've talked over the years, but what the reason why I heard from you recently was I heard from a few people about this very sad news about Jenny Burpee, who mm-hmm. apparently has died, and... Of course, that brings up the whole Cat White, Jim Carrey thing, which I wrote about. But you you knew her in the Sea Org, and thank you for reaching out to me and, and telling me a little bit about her in the Sea Org, and I included it in the story. But uh, just just a terrible story, isn't it? It is. It's it's really sad. Um, I, yeah, I've it's been something that it was so unexpected, but... Yeah, it's just sad. It's I just there's no other way to describe it other than a really sad story. But you know, it was nice. Uh, I felt I was really happy to end the story though with that positive note that in the Sea Org you found that she was kind of a delight. She was. She absolutely was. She was a beautiful person. Like she was very bubbly, very, very loving, and and knew everyone. It was like a social butterfly, and. Uh, yeah, I, she was a great person. Well, we still don't know what happened exactly, but, uh, we do know that another Scientology life was cut short. Jenny died at only 39 and, um, I, I had been interacting with her some, and I can tell you she was definitely having some very, very difficult mental issues. Uh, and you know, the problem in Scientology is, is Scientologists are trained not to seek out professional psychiatric care for that kind of thing so i don't i think she was out of scientology at the end there but i don't know that she still would have sought the help she needed yeah i'm not i don't know what i don't know what she would have like how she would have gotten help to i think her dad was her dad's a pretty big scientologist and um I, i don't even know if she would have been allowed to get the help she needed um but I also don't know what I don't know anything about her final years. So I, other than what I saw on social media, um, and I so I don't know how close she was to her family either. I know that they were, they were trying to help her, but I don't know what that help entailed. Right. Yeah. But I know well, it would have been for her to go where she needed to go with her upbringing. Yeah, yeah. And I've talked to Scientologists that have been out for quite a while, and they still uh, find it difficult to seek therapy if they need it or, you know, they, it's just so conditioned to the Scientologist's mind that the most evil force in the universe is psychiatry. So I guess it's tough getting past that. Well, now you've been out for a while and, you know, one of the things I enjoy talking to you about was you're doing great. Um, but you've had quite a journey and I thought, you know, since I heard from you, it might be fun to go back over that story of yours and uh, please tell us tell us about your journey into Scientology and how you got out. <laughs> well, into uh, I was just sort of born and raised in it. My my parents met each other at the Vienna Org in Austria, and they were both Scientologists. And um, they had my brother and then they had me and then they moved when my mom was pregnant with my sister, they moved to California because they decided to join the Sea Org. And I don't know the whole story there, but my dad did say like there was a lot of stuff that kind of led to that moment and that I was apparently going through some stuff or they were dealing with some stuff with me. And that was one of the reasons they chose to move, but he never elaborated. And then he cut ties. So we, he never could really tell me that story. Um, but yeah, they joined the Sea Org and then my sister was born here. And then I grew up in the cadet org and in LA and then also at the pack ranch in Saugus. And then I joined the Sea Org. Oh, uh uh-huh. So you were, so you were born in Austria Yeah. and then at four, the family moved yeah. to LA and your dad, your dad seemed to imply that part of the reason they left was because of you. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, I don't know the what there's there was no elaboration on that other than I think he insinuated that I was having like issues like I would wake up crying um and actually I just remembered to one time he did tell me a story of how I woke up crying I don't remember how old I was but I was really young and I woke up crying and then like it was my mom ended up taking me and then like helping me and and then it turned out that (laughs) this is so ridiculous uh it turned out there was like another Satan trying to take over my body oh um yeah and my mom was ot at the time so she could like communicate <laughs> with the other thing and i don't know who won uh so <laughs> I, could be, I could be a totally different being than what originally overtook this body or chose this body as my mom says um so yeah that that was a that was maybe one of the things that i was dealing with I, yeah i don't I don't really know other than I think I was getting sick sometimes and maybe they were like, she's PTS to her, to like my mom's side of the family. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the reason was. That was sort of the insinuation that I got, but there was no details as to what was happening with me. And so your parents were really into it. They're in Sea Org and uh, this is an era when, you know, Sea Org parents would just drop their kids off at the cadet org or the ranch or whatever. So yeah. uh, the, now the particular, you mentioned a couple different places. What were some of the places like where you were, you were a child in Scientology? What were they like? Um, the first place was the CEO, which was where I think it's called the Garden Pavilion now at CC, at CC in, in LA. Um, there's, like this pavilion, but there used to be a whole school there. Um, And we had a big, well, big to us. So it was probably not that big, but uh, a backyard and um, we would do school there and we would do like kindergarten stuff. And then we'd all play in the backyard and then our parents would come for family time in the later afternoon. And then they would leave and, then we would go and sleep in our cots um, in these big rooms. And then our parents would come, I think between like 10 and midnight, although it was often later than that, but they would come and pick the kids up and then take us to the birthing wherever we were. And we were actually at the Shanger Lodge, which is like right next to the, to CC. So we would just, our parents would come and then just, walk us over to our apartment at the Shanger Lodge. And uh, yeah, and then we do it all over again. Wow. Yeah. And um, so uh, when did you start, how old were you when you actually started to, to be involved in yourself as far as, I don't know, processing, auditing, that kind of thing? Really young, actually. I was. I remember going to CC from the CEO. Um, I would walk over and get audited by this lady named Natalie Ellis. I think um, she later subsequently died of cancer, but she she was a really nice lady, and she was one of the parents of one of the kids at the CEO and. I have no recollection of what kind of auditing I was getting, but I remember I had to go and get processing while like every, I mean, often enough that I remember it. Right. But I don't remember the specifics. Um, And then I also did the, I think I did the uh, Purif kind of young too. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cause Sunny the other day was telling me she did it at 10. Yeah, it might have been like 10, 11 for me, which is pretty young considering there's not a lot of opportunity for toxins and stuff that they're worried about coming out. But yeah, I remember doing it kind of young and I had a, I had this rash that would come on my, on my face a lot and would like pop up out of nowhere or like if I ate mangoes or something, we never could really figure it out, but 
that like started started up when I was doing the Purif and my dad was like you should probably see a doctor and I was like no dad this is just the side effects of like this is the impurities coming out <laughs> um during you know the sauna and stuff and I think I had it for a couple of days and then it went away like normal okay so then at, uh it was the LA riots around in which were what 1992 when some things changed for you yeah, well, first that we had like some flooding in LA. There was a bunch of rain, and then the roof started collapsing at the CEO. So they moved us to the Anthony Building on Fountain, and then we would go from the Anthony Building. That's where we would sleep, and then we'd go from there to. That's kind of when all the kids stopped living with their parents too. We had dorms now that we stayed in at the Anthony Building, and then we would sleep there, and then walk to the ATA, which was at PAC base. Um, every day we would walk there and back um, and do school like that. And then the riot started and that's when they kind of moved everyone to the ranch. Which was like farther north in, in LA County somewhere? That was in Saugus. County. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah it was like um, Santa Clarita, I don't know exactly what county it's in, but yeah, I was in like the mountains. So it was like um, sort of remote and out of the way. I think it was like a two hour drive. Well, maybe one to two, one and a half hour drive from PAC. From the Pacific Area Command, the big blue in downtown LA. Yes. Yeah. And uh, what was it like at this ranch? Um. It was different because you did, you no longer like had the opportunity to see your parents uh, all the time. You only saw them on the weekends if they actually came and saw you. And then sometimes they would bus us down to see our parents too on like Sunday morning. But yeah, it was, uh, we had like, I think three main dorm buildings with five rooms each and it was sort of like uh, you kind of had your own, I think before it was like you just got a bunk bed in at, when we were at the AB. And when we went to the ranch, you kind of had your own bed with like drawers underneath, which was kind of cool. Um, but then it was like, okay, you, everyone has a, a job. You have a post. You have, you know, you're beholden to your, your statistics. And if your stats are up or down that determines whether or not you would be able to ask for the day off um, and we did physical labor sometimes a lot of that um, especially I think during the summertime when we didn't have to do school legally uh, there were like some trailers that we would have to renovate or like the fields of uh, weeds that we would have to de-weed and so it was a lot of like manual labor and then or like physical labor and then uh you also had your own job that you would have to work at and make sure that you did your job Otherwise and again be... about how old were you at this point uh i want oh maybe i was 10 so that means i probably did my period earlier than that 10 but years I, old yeah i think i was like 10 um, and I just I just want to point out we're talking about the Canyon Oaks Ranch, yeah, which is yeah. not the same thing as the Mace Kingsley Ranch, which is the real notorious one, um, yeah. that uh, was in Palmdale and then in New Mexico. Um, yeah, that was kind of where the the tough the the hard to figure out kids went, and this was just strictly Sea Org members kids were at the pack or the Canyon Oaks Ranch or Pack Ranch. So even though it wasn't sort of the um, tougher one, it still sounds like quite an experience for a 10-year-old to be on your own. Your parents weren't around and uh, you had jobs and stuff. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, it sounds sort of like a mini Sea Org. It was. I mean, yeah, like my dad had a day off and he came up to visit and he 
was told that I was not allowed to go with him because my stats were down that week. Jeez, incredible. <laughs> yeah. And I, that was an issue that I had with my dad later. I said, I don't, I don't understand why you didn't stand up for, for me and like say, no, I finally have a day off. I'm taking my kid. Um, and yeah, he, anyway, that was, do that you was, remember, do you remember, um, how it was explained to you at that time that this all made sense, that there was some reason why you kids were away from your parents and living on this ranch outside of town? Yeah. I mean, we were training to be in the Sea Org. Um, it was very much like, you know, we got to clear the planet. That was very much the message that we all got for, I mean, our, we all knew our parents were in the Sea Organization. So that was always the message. Like our parents are clearing this planet. They're going to make the world a better place. And then it was like, okay, now it's time for you to train to be the next Sea Org member. So we, we would have like um, CMO messengers come up and like talk to us about being in the Sea Org and like sort of like a mini recruitment thing to kind of get us excited about it. And then, um, yeah, and we would do our Scientology studies and then our regular reading, writing and arithmetic studies. Um, but that was it. Like we were mostly just, it was like, you need to learn to read, write and do some math, but that's all you really need to know. A couple people could do a couple extra things. Like you could do some other courses. Um, but mostly then it was like, and then you do your Sea Org studies, you learn about Scientology, um, or your Scientology studies, sorry. You learn about Scientology and, and all the different, like the ARC triangle, TRs, uh, communication course how to the I'm, I'm forgetting a lot of them which is actually good. <laughs> right <laughs> um but yeah we did a lot of Scientology studying as well and that was definitely emphasized and so at what point did they expect you to actually sign your billionaire contract and become a Sea Org member well when I was 13 um, I finished, so we, when we did the, um, the reading, writing and arithmetic, I think there was a certain level, which unfortunately I forget what the level was like, uh, yeah, that you would have to pass a certificate. So like, or you'd have to pass a test and then you get your certificate. So you get your A cert, your B cert and your C cert, which was reading, writing and arithmetic. And once I got all three like the same day, which coincidentally was a Thursday, um, the cadet coordinator at the time, Doug Fionica, uh, talked to me and my, my friend Brittany at the time and said, hey, you guys finished your three certs, uh, your A, B, and C certs, so now you're going in the Sea Org today. So I had like no prep and I was like what? I I wasn't even to be honest. I wasn't really excited about joining the Sea Org. I was trying to figure out a way that I could not join, but I didn't really see any way because both my parents were in and all of my family was in Austria. Um, the rest of my family. So, yeah, he said that, and then it was like race down the mountain, go to pack, sign your sign your contract, do the little intake interview. Um. And now you're on the EPF. Wow. Yeah, it was very, very quick. I, I barfed on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it was because I was nervous or because he was driving really fast, but or, or a mix of both. But that was that was a rough day for me. I was not happy. And then uh, when a new Sea Org member has to go through something called the EPF, right, which is kind of like a boot camp. Yeah. Yeah. That took me Is like that what three you did months. Then or was it later? Yeah. Three yeah, months? Yeah, that took me about, yeah, I was, I was very resistant to it. I think I was just trying to like take as long as I possibly could. And then I did finish and then I went to a uh, CMO pack. So then I had to do the CMO EPF after that. Which is the Commodore Messengers Organization. 
exactly, of the yeah. Pacific Area Command. We got all these acronyms. Mm -hmm. We got to spell them out. So, uh, yeah. so what was the idea? What what were they preparing you for? What job did they want you to do? Um, well, I ended up being the commanding officer's communicator. So I was the CEO's comm for a little bit, but I was so out of my depth because he would, he was like, Hey, I need you to go get the stats from, oh man, I don't, I'm not going to remember all these acronyms, but it was like, I need you to go to the FCC office and go get the, uh, GI stats and the, I, I, I'm very happy that I don't remember these acronyms, but I don't acronyms, but I don't remember. I, I can't say them, but it was basically like all these different statistics and every one of them was an acronym. And I was like, I don't know what this means. So I had to like try to remember in my head what I was asking for. So then I would go ask these people for their stats and then they, they would be like, which ones? And I'd be like, I don't know. I felt so stupid. <laughs> I felt so out of my depth and I was like, I don't want to be here. And it didn't last long. I don't think I lasted more than a year before I, I was like, I put my foot down and said, I'm, I can't, I can't do this. I'm not ready for this. I need more education. And yeah. And then, so you were out of the Sea Org for a little bit, but you went back. Yeah. yeah I, uh, they sent me back to the EPF and then they sent me back to the ranch after another like three months of just sort of making me wait on the EPF. And then they, yeah, they sent me back to the ranch and then I had a, a friend there who also had been at CMO, but she had been at the, the CMO int, which is at the, the gold base, I think. Um, All right. And she somehow, she had gotten in trouble and then ended up back at the pack ranch. And, uh, she, someone convinced her to rejoin the Sea Org. And then she was like, well, I'm not going to do it without Clarissa. <laughs> and then convinced me to do it. And what they wanted was for us to train to be supervisors and then come back to the ranch as Sea Org members and as supervisors and then supervise the kids at the ranch. So that's what we did to, um, yeah, that's what, that's how I got back into it. And so you were supervising the school? Yes, I did my okay. training for quite a while. And then I, um, and then they wanted me to be an auditor. And I said, no, I only was told I was going to be a supervisor. Somehow I got out of that and then was able to finish my training for a supervisor and got to the ranch. And then I, I was there for a couple years supervising the kids on the Scientology studies. So you were putting them through what you had been put through. Yep. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And then, but you did get out of the Sea Org. Uh, what, how old were you when you finally got out the next time? I was 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, how did you, uh, how did you get out? Well, I ended up at like three more. They I, first of all, they took me from the ranch to train to go to um, the Gold Base. They wanted me to go to CMO Int and then RTC. At some point during that, I realized I really didn't want to do it. Like I was already not really excited about being in the Sea Org, and so when I I did like some one of those things they have you do where it's like um, look at all your purposes and stuff and sort of line them up all your purposes on all your different dynamics. And my main two were like learn art and learn German. And it had nothing to do with anything in the Sea Org. So, uh, and, and, and when you say RTC of gold, I mean, this is like <laughs> the cream of the crop. They, they were, yeah. they were trying to get you, I mean, you know, the Sea Org is an elite, group inside of Scientology, but the Sea Org itself has a hierarchy with yeah. some groups more elite than others. And near the very top of that pyramid is the RTC, which stands for the Religious Technology Center. It's uh, nominally the group that runs all of Scientology. And at 
Gold Base is that secretive base near Hemet, California. So they were they were asking you to become very close to David Miscavige up at the very top of things, right? Yes, I would have had to be extremely dedicated. And the Gold Base was like this secret like thing that like only the top people went to. So like I, it was just sort of this. I don't know, the idea of going to some secret place where you're even more important and have an even bigger job, I was just like, no, like I am not dedicated enough to to do that. You wanted to learn art and learn German. Yeah, like <laughs> exactly. Priorities, right? Uh, yeah. So the, that was not in. And then when I said that, when I was like, uh, don't, this is not for me, the girl was like, so we're handing you a platter of gold and you're just going to reject it or something to that effect. And I just was like, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. Yeah, that is correct. So obviously they weren't happy with me. So then I got moved to another org where I was traded because I was supervisor trained. I was important um, because they always needed people who were tech trained somehow or another. Um so then I was used to move someone else to some other org. And then anyway, I, I kind of moved around a bit. And isn't there a I, word for that in the CR? You're considered like a token or something. What's the word they use? Um, yeah, I don't. Is it token? They uh, Anyway, I'm sorry, but you're like a coin or something that you, they can trade you for somebody else or whatever. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. No, exactly. I, and then I, I, I ended up in Asho Foundation at the PAC base. And that's the, the org that you're working weekends and you're working evenings. So I didn't see like any of my friends and- um, And that's the American St. Hill Organization at the Pacific Area Command, which is a particular building and org there in the, in the big blue complex and is that where they were delivering the uh, briefing course? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So very important, you know, cog in the machine, a particular yeah. building in that co collection of buildings. And, but, but, but like many Scientology facilities, they have a day crew and a night crew that it's called day and foundation. The, the, so you were working weekends and nights and you weren't seeing anybody. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like all my days off were when I wasn't with my friends that I had in there. And so it was a little isolating and I already wasn't happy. And then um, I, I got in trouble for something like I went, I was going to the chiropractor chiropractor and some higher executives saw me and my friend walking to the chiropractor or back and they sent security to get us. And uh, security came in their car and literally like put us in their car like we were like they were the police and we were getting arrested. Wow. And um, it was that kind of a feel. Then they brought us back to the basement of the Asho building and um, a couple executives sort of proceeded to just sort of yell at us. And my memory of this is literally just sitting there and being yelled at. And then I just I just blocked them out. Um, but then I got to my room to go change into my uniform and I had a note from my boss and she, it was something like kind of nasty. Like, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was just the straw that broke my back. And so I, I left, I just walked out and went to the bus station and took the bus all the way down to the, to the beach and just sort of like was like this oh I think I had I had um, asked for requested leave on my birthday too and they disapproved it with no reason why um, and so that was also on top of everything else I, that was just like that was too much for me to get this wow. nasty note on my bed and so I just yeah. I was like I'm going to the beach I'm done <laughs> so I left and I just sat there and I was like, fully expecting them to track me and find me but they didn't so in the evening I ended up having to call my brother and say like hey 
I'm at Santa Monica. Um, I'm with all these strange, weird night people. <laughs> Can you please <laughs> come pick me up? And uh, so him and a friend came and picked me up because uh, he worked in the evenings and his friend had a car. So, yeah. And then I obviously I got in trouble for that and um, got commed and uh, the commed said if I if like the findings on the committee of evidence was that if I, I should go to the RPF and if I, because technically I left my course room unattended, which is like some kind of crime or high crime in the, in the Sea Org. And so that was the suggestion was that I do the RPF. And if I don't, if I refuse to do the RPF, then I get declared, which is really extreme. Um, <laughs> So, so you were put through what's called a committee of evidence, which is basically Scientology's version of a court martial. Yeah. And they recommended that you go to the Rehabilitation Project Force, RPF, which was the prison, basically the prison program of the Sea Org, mm -hmm. and can last months, it can last years. Um, and your alternative was either to go voluntarily in that prison program or be basically excommunicated, what they call um, declared, declared a suppressive person. And then you'd lose access to all your family and friends. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite a and choice you had. I know. And the reason that they wrote specifically, otherwise get declared, if I refuse, is because in the committee of evidence, when I was talking to them, I mentioned, yeah, I would never do the RPF. Because I saw, I, I mean, I watched these people just for years be on this program that, and they would just be like, they were just like corpses walking around. Like they just looked so beaten down, I guess, is how the best wow. way to describe it. And yeah. so that was just not an option for me. I was like, that there is no, I'm not even dedicated enough to commit myself to do that, to do this job. Why would I want to commit to doing that? Living right. in the basement, like, no. Ugh. Not being able to have any time off for years? No, no thanks. So what did so they do to you? because I said that. What? So what did they do with you? Uh, well, the thing about a committee of evidence is that one of the parts of it is if it, if it lingers to, like, I don't remember the exact wordage, but... If it takes too long to be approved and come to the conclusion, it just gets thrown out. Um, and the LRH communicator, who is the person who who is one of the people who received that comev and have to the findings and recommendations and have to kind of approve it, he knew me. So one day he like pulled me aside and said, "Hey, I." want to just talk to you about what's going on. So I kind of explained to him my side of what, everything that happened. And so he just, he just held on to it until it expired. Oh, he dragged his feet to help yeah. you out. Yeah. That's a high crime of its own, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know, but probably somewhere. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, that never turned into every, anything, which was, lucky for me. And then okay. uh, they convinced me to, because like I said, I was a supervisor. They convinced me to go back onto my post and supervise for them while I was routing out. So they said, "Will we see that you want to leave. We get it. Can you supervise for us while you're in the middle of like, we'll do all the steps. Like we'll do the sec check on you um, while you're also doing this job. And I was like, okay, well, sure. Okay. And then um, that dragged on for a while. And then uh, COB, uh, David Miscavige came to the base and he did a walkthrough and I did not see him, but he must, he saw someone who was on the decks, which is what you normally do. Like people who are kind of in the middle, not on a job, probably want to leave. So they're just doing physical labor all day while getting their sack check or whatever it is they're, they're trying to handle or fix. It's like, 
it's not as bad as the RPF, but you're also kind of probably on your way out of the Sea Org. Okay. And um, he saw someone and asked, like, what are they doing? And they said, oh, they're waiting to do their sec check or whatever. Anyway, at some point he saw that and he said, well, if they want to leave, let them leave. What? Yeah. Mm. And then myself and one other friend of mine and then like three other people or four other people, we were all pulled aside and like pulled into a basement room, which I had never seen before. We were pulled into a room and told, okay, you guys are all leaving. We're going to do a quick sec check. And all your sec checks, once you're done with your sec check, security checks, then you're going to be like you're out of here. So I had like, I want to say like maybe three days and then I was gone. Like they, they said they found, um, they found someone to, that had like a Scientologist, a local Scientologist who had a company called Task Management where they send people out to like different malls in, in America. And then you like have a little kiosk. Anyway, they sent me to this, to someone who owns. In other words, they found a job for you. They, yeah, they, you, exactly. they put you through the interrogations, which are security checks or sec checks. And then they they found this sort of landing spot for you. Yeah. Yeah. And right before I left, um, I was in the, horseshoe at the pack base and uh they were like hey we need you by the way my dad had been in florida for i think maybe at this time five years um he was training in florida my parents were still married but they sent him to train so he was there for five years and only my mom was local like she worked at the holly the hgb or hollywood guarantee building in hollywood and I had told her that I wanted to leave and I assumed she would tell my dad, but I guess she didn't because they told me one more thing you have to do before you leave is to tell your dad that you're leaving. And I was like, Oh, okay. My dad was already notoriously hard to get a hold of because I could, I don't know. I could never, it was very hard to stay in, in touch with him while he was out there and when I told my mom that I wanted to leave the Sea Org, she said, well, why did you pick this body? Why did you pick this family? Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was pretty hurtful. Um, and just, I don't know, it's crazy. Um, but I assumed that she would talk to my dad about it too. But my mom is a really good Scientologist and there's a policy called leaving and leave. And if you want to leave, you cannot tell any other Seer member that you want to leave or that you are leaving. Um, so she didn't tell my dad, um, even though I'm his kid, he's her husband. So you had to inform him yourself? So they told me, you need to call your dad. And I was like, oh, good luck getting a hold of him. And then sure enough, they did, <laughs> obviously. Uh, and uh, I had to tell him and he was shocked. Like he was very surprised and sort of like, what are you going to do? And I was just like, I don't know, but I got to go. And I'm, I, I just can't do it anymore. And he was clearly upset. Like he was shocked and sad and um so that was a weird moment for me but then like once I like got off the phone and like turned around and it was real like holy crap I'm leaving I have to say that was quite literally the happiest day of my life even to this day <laughs> Because nothing, wow. nothing in my life that has been wonderful since then could have happened without that moment of right. leaving. Right. <sighs> wow. Yeah. But then, um, I mean, a lot has happened since then. So, so, you know, born to a dedicated Scientologist, this is the kind of thing that can happen. The kids 
they think of you as just a you know mini mini Sea Org member, and you grow up in it, and now you've disappointed them. But a lot happened after that. So tell me, so how did you meet your husband? Uh, he actually, I knew him growing up because he was one of my friend's older brothers. Um, like him and my brother hung out. He's also uh, was born and raised into it, essentially. Um, and we met at a party. Uh, we were at a mutual friend's 30th birthday party at a bar. And uh, we sort of reconnected and realized we had some ideals in common and um it kind of progressed pretty quickly and then I moved in with him and um yeah and then we had our two kids and uh he joined the military in that time and he went to Afghanistan twice and the second time uh it was in i think 2012 or 13 okay. okay um so a lot of time had kind of passed and uh we when he was there that time um he started to unbeknownst to me he started to read stuff online um which so you you guys were so so you had left the sea org Oh, but yeah. you were still a Scientologist, and so was your husband. Yeah, except oh, okay. I'm very much more so than him. So okay. even though when I left, I still felt like the Sea Org, like my thoughts on it was Scientology is correct, but the Sea Org is corrupt. The people are not following the policies because, well, for their own reason, but that is what is making the Sea Org such an awful place to be. So that was my way of rationalizing everything. Right. And then it was like, well, you got to pay off your freeloader debt, which my freeloader debt was like $40,000 um, because of all the, the, when they wanted me to go to the RTC, they had been doing like security checks and stuff like that, different auditing actions on me. And that added up to forty thousand dollars somehow. Right. So had, and so this is yeah. something that Scientologists are told that, you know, um, when you leave, now suddenly you have to pay for the training that you were given over many years. Yes. And it's called a freeloader's debt. Um and legally it's not enforceable, but most Scientologists either don't know that. Or even if they're aware of that, they are like, well, I got to pay it, right? Because I don't want to get in trouble. Did yeah, you well, pay you off your 40000 <laughs> No. But you have to pay it off. You have to pay off your free letter debt in order to keep moving on the bridge. Right. So if you want to go to a Scientology org and do courses and get auditing still, you have to take care of that debt first. And then you can pay for the courses. Incredible. Um, so obviously that wasn't an option for me. That was something I struggled with for a few years. Just the idea of the, the freeloader debt um, was very hard for me. Cause I thought I gave so many years to you guys of my life. Like, I don't feel yeah. like I owe you anything. Right. But eventually I kind of um, came to terms with it because I think mostly because my, my mom and my brother my brother was in security. So, and then my mom was just like a diehard Scientologist or Sea Org member. So like them talking about me to anyone, it just looked really bad on them that I wasn't doing anything about it. So I would try to like do a little something here and there, maybe pay like seven bucks. Like my dad convinced me like, just pay like a dollar a month or something. Uh -huh. like, yeah, like just a little bit, you know, to kind of keep the flow going. Like, and <laughs> so that didn't last very long for me. I think I probably paid off like four, four bucks. And then um, eventually there came a point when they were selling the basics where it was like right around that time period. They started kind of forgiving some of the debt, reevaluating some of the debt if you were under age. 
uh, which I was for quite a bit of it, but two of two years I wasn't. Um, and so, yeah, they just sort of, I think they were just like, let's just get what we can from these guys. And then also the basics hit. So then it was like, well, if you buy the basics and you pay like a thousand dollars, then your freeloader debt will be like done and eliminated. We will eliminate. Oh wow! Yeah, what they had all these weird, Yeah, <laughs> they had all these weird things that they were doing at the time, and so I kind of took advantage of that. And my mom also, she called me at like midnight one night and was like, "I have a solution. <laughs> you can use my credit card and buy the basics and." Uh, you can put it on my card and then just, I'll just mail the card to your house and then you can just pay it off over time. Anyway, it was a whole, obviously Ethan wow. wasn't happy about that. Um, so now was, he was, your husband was starting to have doubts. Um, what about you at that time? I was still sort of like, I don't really want to do anything with it, but I still believed it. And then I eventually, I, I, like my, my mom and brother kind of convinced me to do the remote courses. I forget what they're called when you do it remotely. Like you don't, um, you're not extension courses. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So you're just sort of sending in your finished papers, um, but you're doing it at home. And so I started the, um, science, I started doing the science of survival. Yeah, that's what it's called. There's a book, the science of survival, and there's a course for it. So I started that and I started over like four times and I just was like, why, like, why am I? Cause I thought, okay, well I'm disinterested. So I must have a word that I don't understand. Cause that's what you're taught. So then I would go back, find a word I didn't understand, retry to start again. And I would just have the same scenario. And I finally that, had a moment. Hmm? That book, that book is brutal. It's so bad. That, that book is so bad. Yeah. Uh, no wonder you got, well, thank goodness you ran into that book because that'll <laughs> kill anybody's interest. <laughs> yeah. It was very hard to plow through. Uh, yeah. And so I, I had a moment where I just sort of stopped and I was like, why am I not? finishing this like why am I not doing this and then I just realized I don't freaking want to I do not want to do this I'm only doing this to please my mom and my brother for their like status in Scientology and I and I was like wow okay I don't want to do Scientology like I don't want to it was like this weird light bulb moment for me and I told my mom and my brother and my dad and I and they were just like it's okay. Like we understand. I was like, yeah, I never, I didn't find Scientology. You guys did, but I was just kind of born and raised with it. And so like, I don't have this like aha moment. And my brother was like, it's fine. I have no doubt that you will find it eventually on your own. And, uh, so everything was fine (laughs) until Ethan got back from Afghanistan And he told me that I told him what had happened with, with that. And then he said, well, I've been looking at stuff online and I was Uh like, I was, (laughs) I was so worried. I was so scared. Like, Oh my God, babe. Like we, you, what? And, uh, it, it was like quite a shock for me. And I was so concerned. Like you, you can't do that. Like you're going to be in so much trouble. And he just like kind of was like, he was very calm about it. And he was just like, I just, I think that you should look for yourself. And, you know, there's just all this really bad stuff about David Miscavige. And I was like, okay, I can kind of, I can see, I can see that David Miscavige is the enemy over L. Ron Hubbard. So that was my thought process when I started reading and then I started reading and it was your site and then a couple other uh, sources 
and sites on online and it quickly became you know less about David Miscavige and more about just Scientology in general and L. Ron Hubbard and then like LRH never <laughs> he wasn't some two-year-old on riding bucking bronx on horseback like <laughs> and like like that story and then like the story about his all of his accomplish, accomplishments in the military. Right. When I was reading that stuff about him, I it was like, oh, this makes so much more sense than everything mm. I've been told he accomplished my whole life. Right. The idea and see, the that all is, of and I, I tell yeah. people he lived a remarkable life. L. Ron Hubbard had some amazing things happen to him, and if he had just stuck to what happened <laughs> he wouldn't have run into this problem but he as as you know russell miller explained so brilliantly in bareface messiah everything got embellished and invent, reinvented and that's the problem is that he 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 turned what might have been an interesting story into something preposterous and then the church is stuck because they kind of have to go with whatever he was bragging about and yeah, once you start poking at it and looking at it, you realize, no, he wasn't a nuclear physicist. <laughs> he took a single course in atomic physics, physics in college and failed it. You know, stuff like that is just, you know, devastating, I think. And, uh, you know, some people still try to defend him that against those things. But I can imagine it must have been something going through that process after you had been hearing these things about him your whole life. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting and it was very, uh, like reality shattering. Like I was just like, whoa, my whole life is a lie. Um, and that was extremely hard to kind of just wrap my head around. Like literally everything that I learned isn't true and then now I have to figure out what is actually what in there is maybe a little bit true what I, anyway it was <laughs> I felt like I was sort of lost for a little bit because that was that was a lot to to process but at the same time I was very much like oh yeah this is the yeah okay I'm done like for sure I'm done and then comes the what's my one of my favorite parts of your story is this encounter with your mom in Austria, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh we were all gonna fly out for my grandma's birthday, uh her ninetieth, but she ended up passing away like the month before. So I still ended up going out, uh but it was just my mom and I, my brother, my sister, my dad, no one else was there except for just my relatives in Austria. And um, yeah, I went over there and I think like the first night I told her like I was looking at stuff online and, you know, Scientology just, everything was wrong. Like you guys did it wrong like we were not raised right and Ooh. yeah like and she just was like well you know we're a new religion we're gonna make mistakes wow and so that was kind of like a heated conversation and then uh we sort of carried on and then it came we went to another room and we were still talking and then uh, she was like, I just don't understand why you didn't tell me that you were looking at this stuff online and like why. And I said, Mom, I was worried that you would disconnect from me if I told you anything. And she looked at me dead face. Like I was at this point, I was crying because it was like it got emotional. It got heated. And I was like sobbing. <laughs> and I was like, I was really worried you would disconnect from us. And you know, you barely already see the kids as, as it is. And she just looked at me and said, I would disconnect from you. Oh, wow. And that was just, man, that was it for me. I was, it was like everything just sort of was like, 
calm and I was like, okay, this person doesn't love me. <laughs> like I am crying over this person who has no emotions for me and no feelings and doesn't, and would so easily disconnect from their own daughter where I had two kids. Like that's not something that I could imagine. Yeah. So that was it. Like, I was like, okay, I'm done. And then, you know, she kind of kept talking after that. And then she started talking about these babies, these unborn babies in their mother's tummies and they're getting drugged. And this is where she starts crying and getting emotional. She's talking about these babies in these baby, like hypothetical unborn babies in these mother's tummies that are getting drugs and how she has to do something to save them. And uh, I was just like, okay, we're on different so clear, levels. Yeah. Clearing the planet. So in order to save these uh, strangers yeah, was more real to her than the family she was ripping apart in front of her very eyes. Yes, exactly. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So and, then after that, the trip was, was awkward. Also, she called my brother. Um, so the next morning that was in the evening and then the, the day that I came and then the next morning she called my brother or one of the, next, one of the next days, my brother called and she's like, Oh, Odo's on the phone for you. We're like in a remote cabin in the Alps, by the way. <laughs> so it was like, uh, yeah, it was weird. And I answer the phone like, hi, how are you? And he's like, he just started ripping into me. He was so mad at me yeah. because my mom had like told him that I was, I don't know exactly what she told him, but she kind of really made it sound super bad. And so he was thinking like, I was just, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but it was, she definitely over exaggerated everything that had happened. And I, um, he wasn't even mad at me for looking at stuff online. He was mad that I was like trying to turn the family and like, I don't know. Right. It's always <laughs> your fault. Yes. Always yeah. Your it was, fault. It was very so, so you haven't seen your mother since that trip, right? No, I haven't. And your brother, you mentioned his name is Odo. He's kind of a well-known security guy at Pack Base, right? Yes. Yeah, well, he shows up in pictures all the time. Yeah. Um. So you're they're they're still in, and they're they've cut you out of their lives. Yeah, it took a while for my brother and my dad to fully cut the tie. I kind of stopped responding to my mom after that trip. Um, but they were still talking to me. My brother called me and tried to sort of convince me, you know, that reading the stuff online was really bad. And I could tell someone else was on the phone with him during the whole conversation. And um, he was basically like, just anyway, it was, it was an awful conversation. But he was telling me, like, you shouldn't read this stuff. And I was like, no one has ever no one is ever going to tell me again what I can and cannot read. That's just not an option anymore for me. And uh, obviously he didn't like that. And that was kind of the last conversation I had with him. And then my dad emailed me a couple times and then he just kind of stopped responding as well after I sort of, I sort of did the same thing with him. He, cause they wanted to, there was a whole other committee of evidence that they were doing between Ethan and I after my mom came back and told her, basically told on me. Um, okay, okay. And then, so they they actually convinced Ethan to come in, come to the pack base um, and for the committee of evidence, because I was like, no, I'm not going there. You'd and already I, been through one. Yeah, and I I also was like, I just feel like they're just gonna bombard me. Like I don't I don't want to go. So, um, yeah, he ended up going, and then they, but then they he wanted to know what do you have on Clarissa that you're like, what why are you doing this? Because they 
anyway, they weirdly looped him into it. He was very quiet and just kind of doing his own thing. They didn't know anything about um, him at all. Um, but they just sort of looped him in to the Committee of Evidence. So he was like, I'm curious. And we had a friend that he was not quite willing to lose yet. Um, anyway, so he went down and they didn't tell him anything about me or what they had on me. They had some weird stuff from like his sister who had written something up about him like many years before. And uh, so they really had nothing on him. They were just kind of using that as an excuse, I don't know, to get more info. I don't know, it was really bizarre. And then he convinced me at a later date to go down and go sit in front of them. So I did, but I said, I need you to go there with me because I just, I feel like the moment I get there, I felt like I was still fragile. I was still able to be brainwashed because it, I knew that it like ran so deep and their logic would still like kind of make sense to me. So I was like, I just don't want to be alone. Um, I, I don't want to, I just don't want to, I was really worried about that. Um, cause I knew a lot of people who were like half in half out and then ended up going like back in to Scientology. So, um, anyway, they asked me questions. They showed me reports from my mom, from my best friend's mom, um, from my father, <laughs> There was a whole report from a, a phone conversation he and I had. Um, that was really probably the most hurtful thing report that I saw was the one from my dad because it was a personal conversation between him and I where I was talking. So ba about basically your dad was informing on you. Yes. Yeah. Because that's what you do in Scientology. You inform yeah. on each other. And I thought he was better than that. So, And he not only did he like report on me. In the end, he kind of said, like, well, she said this, and that implies this. So he he went up, like, he jumped ahead and sort of, like, made me even, made it, it sound like I what I said was even worse than what I said. So that really just hurt, and I think that was actually, I, I wrote him an email after that, and I said, that was pretty fucked up, Dad. Like, that was not cool. And that really hurt, and... I don't think he ever responded. I think that was the last communication I sent him. Just incredible that Scientology, this is the end result, you know? Yeah. Parents informing on their kids, Yeah. you know, making up stuff to make them look worse. I mean, just incredible. But I got to ask you, I don't, I don't know if I ever asked you, did, did Ethan go through something like this with his family or, or was – what was his situation, if you can tell me anything? Um, yeah, I can sort of explain it. His mother, his father, he had already disconnected from just because his father was a dick. Um, just to, that that's all there was to it. He wasn't, he wasn't a good dad. Okay. Um, he was a Scientologist, but his mom was actually in the Sea Org still. And... He has three siblings, three sisters, and they're all out of the Sea Org. And at that time, they had all kind of had their own journeys out of Scientology. So he didn't really have anything to lose other than his mom. But that was already sort of a, like, she, there wasn't, it wasn't a close relationship. Um, and they all had like a moment of, Hey mom, this thing that you did was messed up and she didn't really take a lot of responsibility for anything. And, and that sort of just, that relationship just ended. She did some messed up things to them as well. So, but that's his story. So I don't really want to tell it, but I, I just know that he, yeah, she, she tried to have one of her daughters declared and she turned the other kids against her. Wow. So, yeah, she wasn't she wasn't great. And so, how many years now since you've seen your mom? Uh, what was that? 2014. So, wow, nine, nine years. 
And then I think to both your surprise and mine, your mom showed up in a reckless Ben video in 2020. <laughs> yeah, that was really surprising. <laughs> um, the reckless yeah. Ben duo, saw a couple of young guys that took some hidden cameras into Scientology and did some uh, did some really really interesting stuff. Some other stuff was a little goofy, but you know they they uh, they used their hidden cameras to uh, tape a Sunday service that was wild. And then one of them, uh, I guess it was Ben, got auditing, uh, book one auditing, so no e-meter. Um, and the auditor who was taking him through it was your mom. That's right. <laughs> that was a surprise. Um, very interesting to see her do that. Um yeah, but that was like her dream was helping people. So I know that that's what she felt like she was doing was helping him. Right. What was that? No, I thought that, that that was a very I thought that was a very charitable. You said some very charitable things about it. You know to, that she does think she is motivated by the idea that she's helping people. Um, but I don't know. I mean, she yeah. just walks away from a family, grandkids. <laughs> but you know yeah, she's auditing somebody with dianetics you know Gosh. isn't that yeah that's very um the cognitive dissonance you know right you really they're really good at like compartmentalizing things and putting little things in boxes um but she what was the amount of time he was in that session for because it was really long it was really long, and what I remember from it, because I talked to him about it, and what I remember about it that was really interesting was uh, he was a slack line athlete, and mm -hmm. at one point he had broken either an arm or a leg. I can't remember which one, and she had him, of course, you know, in Scientology, you're supposed to lessen the impact of these traumatic incidents where the engrams are, whatever. But whatever, she had him describe this accident he had over and over and over and over. And he was telling me it began to change Yeah. that, that, you know, uh, his, I think his friend was, was telling him, listen, dude, you were making stuff up. And, and it was, it was really good because it kind of showed that um, it, it was, it, you could see the sort of um, mental conditioning going on right in front of your eyes. It was wild. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was good that his friend experienced that because yeah, it was it was to for right. him to that be his, like that his friend was that, there that when he broke the happened. limb and yeah, yeah. exactly. And could, so and he could, could tell say, him no, that didn't yeah. happen because right. he Ben started to kind of believe that that was what happened, right? Right. That the altered story was the truth. Yeah. 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 That whole thing was crazy. The, you know, the worst part about. Ben's recordings was there was one where he I think she showed him a video it was one of like the later ones she was showing him a video and then afterward they were talking and he was like so you're happy here and she was like yeah I mean I've been I've been with my husband for however many years it was like 40 years or and then uh and I have my son I'm and oh. he's here and I'm very happy uh, and, oh. and I was like, woof, when I saw that, I had a very strong reaction and I sent it to my, my sister and she was, she had the exact same reaction as me. That was oh, rough. No. That was imagine. rough. I can imagine. I was like, oh, cool. She's rewriting the story and we are not in it. Incredible. So tell me what the story is today. Tell me how, how well you're doing. What's going on with you? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> life, I feel like life has its ups and downs, but we're mostly doing good. We're, we're, we've got a company that we're, we're, so we're busy constantly. Don't um, you have like teenagers now? I have, yeah, I have a 15 year old and an 11 year old. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a fun it's really fun, or not in a loose way, <laughs> parenting, like, because Ethan and I both grew up 
in a cult. So like we, and we didn't have parenting. I honestly, my parents were better than his parents by far in terms of parenting and being there. My parents actually made an effort uh, where his parents didn't. And so I at least got like love and affection and like, you're going to do great things one day. And uh, we believe in you, even if it was, you know, we believe you'll be a great auditor someday. Uh, right. They, they at least, you know, told me that I could do things. And um, yeah, but we really didn't have very good parenting. So we're, you know, we're kind of like blindly parenting and trying to figure this out. And then our daughter has a intellectual disability, which is its own fun thing to try to, you know, maneuver and go through and yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's very interesting. Life is interesting, that's for sure. Well, I'm I'm sure that you've got a lot of things going on. It's busy and difficult, but uh, uh, it I think it's really important though that you have told your story and let people know what you went through, and that you know help people understand how Scientology rips people rips families apart like this. I mean, it's yeah. just incredible. I have some friends who basically they all have a a similar but very different as well story um, as I do in terms of disconnection. Like I have um, I have my friend Amy who her mom didn't like that she was connected to uh, Sina because Sina had done the Leah show. Right, Sina so Kamula. She, yeah. And so she actually preemptively, before like anyone told her to, she called and told Amy that she was disconnecting from her. Wow. And that was rough. And that was like right around Thanksgiving too. So that was really, that was a tough one. And then on top of it, she kind of still stayed in touch with uh, her son or Amy's brother uh, because he was never really in Scientology that much so like he didn't he ne he never left the sea org he didn't have that journey so he was still okay um which was a weird because while he wasn't a scientologist i guess he had never become a dedicated enough scientologist to then leave it so that was a weird like kind of selective disconnection weird yeah yeah that was really obviously h hard and hurtful and then, um, and obviously there's more to that story as well, but that's just the basics of that. And then, <clears throat> um, obviously my sister as well had, you know, she lost my dad, my mom and our brother as well. Um, and I think they disconnected from her after me, um, cause she stayed in touch with me. And then, um. I have uh, another friend, Catherine, who she's got three boys and um, her parents would come and visit and were part of the kids, their grandkids' lives. And then they ended up disconnecting. And so they, you know, they lost their grand, their three grandkids and their their daughter and then also their son ultimately as well. And the story there as well is that, like, they also lost a son who passed away. So that one's just really, honestly, it's really tragic to me. Like, I just feel like you're, they really just, I don't know. <laughs> That's even worse than just, I don't know. That just seems awful to, like, also disconnect from your grandkids when you've, you've been in their lives, you know? Yeah. Um. Yeah, and then there is Sina, who uh, she's an only child. So that one, um, it was just her and her mom because her dad wasn't in her life. So her mom disconnecting is, I don't know, there's something even worse about that as like a single parent with an only child. And then yeah. disconnecting. Wow. I just feel like it's really. That's terrible. Yeah, it's pretty brutal. Um so, yeah, I mean, and then I have another friend whose mom works at Gold, and uh, she tried to get in touch with her, couldn't get in touch with her. 
asked the police to do a wellness check. They did. And they said she, you know, she's fine. And then she was met with a lawyer calling her to tell her that he represented her mom. Wow. And uh, that, and that was the Moxon guy. Kendrick Moxon. Yes, we all yeah. know him very well. Yeah. So he called her and basically told her, like, I represent your mom and you need to cease and desist. Well, like, and as we learned in the Danny Masson trial, this is one of the things Kendrick Moxon does as an attorney and as a Scientologist. He is used to, uh, you know, in these kind of disconnection situations, he gets to do the dirty work for the church. Yeah. And they used him to scare her into no longer you know, looking for her mom or just trying to make sure that her mom was okay. Wow. Yeah. So, and and yeah, I just, it's so common. These are just like my, my friends that I've stayed in touch with. Um, So in other words, young, younger people, uh, not so long out of Scientology, families ripped apart. And again, the the point we had made earlier that this is going on now, this is not something that was just in the eighties or the nineties. It's happening right now. Right now. Yeah. It's, and it's common. It's not like, you know, they deny it and stuff, but no, it's very much a real thing. And I know your readers know that and your listeners know that, but I still wanted to just make it very clear that this is not, you know, it's not isolated instances. It's very common for them to do this. Yeah. 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 So. Well, listen, thank you so much for taking us through this. I know it's not easy, but uh, I think, you know, I'm really happy that you and Ethan are doing as well as you are. Thank you. And who knows, maybe something will change someday and we'll start to see some of these people come out. But uh, there's no question that these family, I mean, you know, another example where disconnection is keeping families apart right now. This is not something that was only done in the eighties or nineties or something that's keeping families apart right now. Clarissa, thank you so much for taking us through that. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me, Tony. All right. Talk to you later. All right. Bye. Now I'm bunker down in bunker town again, again, again to witness history. A reckoning and a day they all come home. But I'm hunkered down in Uncle Town again, again, again. I'm hunkered down in Uncle Town again, again, again. I'm hunkered down in Oh, uh, yeah.